Well, that probably gets the award for weakest burnout ever. All right, so you just got yourself a new to you car, whether it's your dream car you've always wanted or something you literally drug out of the junkyard. It has unknown maintenance history. Even if you have some service records, I think it's a good idea to hit that reset button on your vehicle maintenance and start fresh and clean. This is really important too, before we do any modification to the car, we gotta get our maintenance handled. So we're gonna be talking about five or so different, really easy, simple, and usually pretty affordable things that's gonna let us hit that reset button for maintenance. Now, I've had this Miata sitting for about eight months, and when I drug it out of the junkyard, who knows how long it sat before. Now, if you're like me and you're super excited about that new car you just got, you want to get it spotlessly clean. Before we do any cleaning, we need to do all of our inspections, and I really like to do all the maintenance too before I clean anything. You may inadvertently clean something off that would be a really big tell that the car has an issue. If that car's been sitting for an extended period of time, a couple of things that we might want to do. We may want to disconnect the ignition coils or disconnect the fuel injectors so we can crank the car and have it not start. You may be thinking, Charles, that's the opposite of what I want. I really want the car to start. But what we're doing when we're cranking the engine without starting it is we're building up a little bit of oil pressure, circulating a little bit of oil through the engine at a lower RPM. This can prevent a little bit of oil starvation in certain points of the engine, and lack of lubrication is the gateway to extreme engine failure. Another one is fuel quality. If the car's been sitting for a long time, there may be moisture in the fuel tank. Draining the fuel tank is kind of an extreme thing. This car basically had no fuel in when I got it, so really all I did was top it up with fresh fuel. It's probably a solid idea, though, to run a fuel treatment to clean and lubricate some of those fuel components. And of course, our tires getting flat spots, dry rotting, all terrible things for tires. These tires are basically trash, so we're gonna get rid of these and get some new high-performance summer tires on this car. Also, big ups to Advanced Auto Parts for teaming up with us on this and a bunch of other Miata project videos. Makes me wonder, do we need a name for this project? I'm not much of a project namer, so I'll throw it out to you guys. What should we name this thing? First up, we're gonna do some of our basic inspections that you may have actually already done before you even bought the car. I bought this car sight unseen, so I didn't really do any of these inspections. Let's go ahead and... Most cars, the air filter is a pretty easy thing to check. Sometimes it's just a couple of clips like this one, a couple of screws. There's, of course, some of them that are kind of terrible. This one's pretty easy. We'll pop our clips, lift our air box out, pull our filter out. Well, the filter's not terribly dirty, but I broke it trying to inspect it. So we're gonna toss this in the trash and put in a new one. For the air filter, we wanna open up the ribs and look for any dirt embedded into the filter. We also wanna make sure that the filter fits properly and seals up the air box. If the filter is not sitting properly, it can cause the airflow meter to not read correctly. Like a lot of what we're gonna talk about today, it's worth taking an extra look at these components. However, for the most part, if you got the air filter out, it may be worth just going ahead and installing a new one. Next, let's do an inspection on our brake fluid. And this car's a manual transmission, so it's got clutch fluid as well. They actually use the same fluid for both, but it's two separate reservoirs. A visual inspection for brake fluid, we're mostly just looking at the color and to see if there's any dirt or debris in here. This is a little bit yellow, which isn't always a bad thing. They do make test strips you can use to test these two fluids, but these two are those systems that I really rather just get fresh, clean fluid in it and even with those test strips that won't tell you whether it's the correct fluid .3.4.5.1 or not. Moving to the clutch fluid, that's considerably darker and definitely needs to be replaced. Moving on to our power steering fluid, our level looks pretty good right in the middle, but what I like to do is just dab it on a piece of paper and see what color it is and see if there's any dirt or nastiness in it. That doesn't look too terribly bad. We'll probably just go ahead and top it off. Next is our engine oil. Now there's two things that I look at when I look at engine oil. I of course check the level and use the dipstick, but I also pull the oil fill cap and inspect this. I'll flip it over, look for any carbon buildup or oil coking on the oil fill cap. That can be a sign of really poor maintenance on a vehicle. Now you might also see this white kind of gooey material on the oil cap. This is a sign of moisture buildup inside the engine. This could be due to something as simple as too many short trips and the engine never really fully getting up to temperature. Could also be something much worse like a blown head gasket. So if you see that moisture buildup, don't panic, but we do wanna do some extra inspections, make sure that we don't have a serious issue. 
On some cars, you can even look down and see a little bit inside the engine. Everything looks pretty darn clean in here when I'm actually super happy about that. Now I'm noticing there is some oil leaking around the valve cover. So we'll be pulling the valve cover off anyway. That'll allow us to do a little bit more thorough inspection of the valve train. Quick note as we make our way back to the engine oil dipstick, we have our PCV valve right here. I would probably recommend replacing this on a lot of cars, especially if it's this style. These are only a couple of bucks and super easy to replace. I'm not gonna do this one today. We'll do the PCV valve when we do our oil leak repair, but if it's only a couple of bucks and super easy to replace, go ahead and replace it. Unfortunately, not all of them are that easy and not all of them are that cheap. Kind of like we did with the power steering fluid, we're gonna do with our engine oil. We'll pull our dipstick, we'll check our level, which looks kind of overfilled, and then we're gonna run it on a clean piece of paper and see what the oil looks like. If you have anything crusty or sparkly in that oil, when you run it on the piece of paper, we may have bigger issues. This looks pretty normal. Also, you can rub it between your two fingers and get a feel for the oil. Doesn't work too well with these kind of textured gloves. So usually you wanna do that barehanded. We're gonna take a look at our coolant next and there's two things we're gonna look at. We're gonna look at the fluid reservoir, which based on the outside looks like the level's right here. Unfortunately, it's not. It's just super dirty. So we may take this off and get it a little bit cleaner. If your car has a radiator cap, we're gonna pull the radiator cap and inspect it. Very, very important this next part. Never open when hot. That is a good way to get yourself severely, severely hurt. Our car has been sitting for a couple of days, so not even warm, the engine's not even warm. Your cooling system's under pressure, that's how it prevents the coolant from boiling. So if you open this, when your car's hot, you're gonna get a big old geyser of coolant coming up and out. Absolutely don't wanna do that, be extra careful here. We'll go ahead and look down in there. The coolant doesn't look too crazy, so I think we'll be able to just get away with a drain and fill. If it was nasty or brown or gross or Anything weird like that, you'd probably wanna do a lot more thorough flushing rather than just drain and fill. Because this throttle body is super easy to get to and super easy to inspect, I'm gonna just take this intake boot off really quick and take a look. We can have a little bit more thorough inspection and decide whether we need to clean the throttle plate or whether it's good to go. That's pretty goopy. We might just go ahead and take it off and clean it. We also wanna make sure we're doing a good inspection of our coolant hoses make sure that none of those are an issue. We wanna look at our drive belts, either serpentine or V-belt, looking for any cracking, any tearing, and we wanna look at the ribs, make sure those look good too. We'll be doing a timing belt video, and in that video we'll be replacing those belts, but this is something super easy and super quick to look at, and maybe pretty easy to replace, Kind of depends on the car. We want to make sure that we're putting the car up in the air as well, inspecting our brakes, inspecting our suspension components. I've done more in-depth videos on both of those things, so I'll be sure to link those up and you guys can check them out. We also want to go ahead and take a look at the wiper blades. And one thing I'm noticing is the edge of this blade is not even hitting the windshield. So these are probably not the correct wiper blades. Whether they're good or not is irrelevant, because if they're not even hitting the windshield, it doesn't really matter. Wiper blades are usually super cheap, Super easy to replace, so we're gonna go ahead and get ourselves a new set of these as well. So we got a couple of initial checks done. You'll notice that I didn't do a couple of things. I didn't check the transmission fluid. I didn't check the diff fluid. Most vehicles now don't have a dipstick for either one of those. So really by the time you get to checking them, you might as well just go ahead and put fresh fluid in them. So when we're draining all of our fluids, we're gonna capture some samples so that we can evaluate these fluids. May also be a good idea to go ahead and check your spark plugs. We've done new spark plugs on this. I'll link that video up for you guys as well. Next up, we gotta get our game plan together. Is a drain and fill gonna be enough or do we need to do a pretty hardcore flush on some of these systems? I think for this car, we're gonna be okay just doing a drain and fill on everything. The only thing extra I'm really gonna do is run some flush through the engine. We'll be doing an engine oil and filter change with an engine oil flush. We will drain and fill the coolant. We will drain and fill the transmission. We will drain and fill the rear diff. We'll flush our brake fluid. We'll flush our clutch fluid. We'll replace that engine air filter. We'll replace the fuel filter. This is also a great opportunity to take some time to document all the things that we're going to be doing. What oil did we use? What transmission fluid did we use? What the mileage currently is on the car? And what the condition of the fluid was when we drained it? When it comes to using the right fluid and how much of each fluid, definitely gonna wanna refer to the vehicle repair manual. Make sure that you're using the right stuff. Luckily, most of this stuff can be done with just simple basic hand tools. A Couple of tools you may not have that are gonna make this job so much more easier and a little bit more fun is gonna be a small hand pump to flush our brake fluid and clutch fluid. 
And one of these lubricant pumps that screws onto the oil bottle, that makes doing the transmission in the diff much, much easier. Oh, don't forget your personal protection equipment, and we're also gonna need something to drain all of our fluids into. Something I like to pay attention to as well when I'm draining these fluids is I don't mind mixing oils together, but I usually keep the oils and the coolant separate. Because we're gonna be doing the transmission and the diff service, we need to have the car off the ground, but we need to have it level. So in this situation, you're gonna either have to have the car up on the lift and level or up on four jack stands. The car being level is a key point when we're setting our diff fluid level and our transmission fluid level. Let's go ahead and start with our oil change. This oil change is a pretty straightforward and basic oil change. We are also going to be doing an engine oil flush. We're gonna add the flush treatment to our engine before doing the oil change. We're gonna let that run for about 10 minutes, shut the engine off and then drain the oil and complete the oil change. Now it's worth noting if you're gonna capture a sample of engine oil to evaluate from the crankcase, Adding this flush may actually distort that a little bit. So if you wanna see what the oil looks like at the bottom of the oil pan, drain a little bit of it off first, then do your oil flush. For these filters that are kind of in a tricky spot, what I like to do is grab a plastic bag and use that to help me remove the filter. You might spill a little bit of oil on the subframe, but using the plastic bag will help capture a lot of that oil. And that makes cleanup a little bit easier. All right, moving back to our transmission next. Servicing the transmission is pretty straightforward. Of course, we wanna make sure we take our fill plug out first and then remove our drain plug. We do this in case we can't get that fill plug out. If you can't get the fill plug out, but you've already taken the drain plug out and drained all the fluid, it gets a lot trickier to put fluid back in it. You can get the fluid back in that way, but it's way harder than filling it through the fill hole. And we're gonna follow that same principle for the transmission as well as the differential. We're gonna capture a small sample of fluid. When it comes to evaluating the transmission fluid, I look at three things. I look at the color. Is it really light, like what we drained out of this transmission? That means it's probably been serviced recently. If it's very dark, that means this fluid's probably been in here a while and it's definitely a good thing that we're changing it. I'm also looking close at that fluid sample to be sure there's no metal in it. This'll look like somebody dumped glitter inside of the transmission fluid. Seeing a little bit of that is actually pretty normal. <laughs> we don't wanna see a glitter bomb and we definitely don't wanna see chunks. Also taking a look at the drain plug, which it's typically magnetic is another good practice. You'll almost always see some kind of contaminant on that magnetic drain plug, which is good because that means it's not rotating around in our transmission. But this right here, what we're looking at is nothing to panic over. For this job, I like pumps like this. If you've never used a pump like this, this works so, so well. Also, if you don't have a seam ripper in your toolbox, get one. It's a must have. What we'll do is we'll grab our bottle of transmission fluid. We'll remove the squirt top that it came with. We'll put our little hose extender on. This one doesn't fit. Well, there you go, tech tip. Make sure you buy, buy the right one that fits in the bottle that you're using. So I guess we'll just cut the top off of this bottle and use it anyway. Normally what you would do though, is you would screw this on to this bottle and then just pump it right in. It makes it really, really easy. Nothing like doing easy things the hard way. There we go. Now, <laughs> now we can go ahead and fill our transmission up. Perfect. When it comes to filling the transmission up, we're gonna use that little pump bottle. We're gonna pump it until fluid starts to trickle back out. Then we'll go ahead and put our fill plug in. And I think next time we do a trans service on this car, we're gonna get a new fill plug. Doing the rear differential service is pretty much the same as doing the transmission service. We'll remove our fill plug first, then we'll remove our drain plug, drain all of the fluid, put the drain plug back in, fill it up till it slightly overflows out of the fill plug, and tighten everybody back down. Evaluating the differential fluid is pretty much the same as the manual transmission fluid. We're looking at color, we're looking for metal contamination, and the big one is the smell. Burnt differential fluid is probably one of the worst smells on the planet. If you have burnt differential fluid, you will 100% know. In fact, it'll probably stink up your garage for like a week. Also, when we're filling our transmission or our differential, we need to make sure that our car doesn't require any kind of special additives. Some vehicles with a limited slip differential will require an additive to the fluid. As with all of these fluids, be sure you're referring to your vehicle owner's manual or the repair manual. Make sure you get the right stuff. 
Next up, let's go ahead and get our brake fluid serviced. We are going to start under the hood. We want to try and extract as much old brake fluid out of the reservoir as we possibly can. Something like a turkey baster works really well for this. Once you get as much of that fluid out as you can, go ahead and top it up with new fluid that meets your car's needs. In our case, we're going to be using DOT4. Next, we're going to go to each wheel and we're gonna pump the brake fluid out until the fluid coming out of the bleeder is clear. Now we are doing a brake fluid flush here, not bleeding the brakes. This means that the order that you do it is not quite as important as it is when you do a bleed. When you do a bleed, that means we've replaced something in the system and we need to remove air. Periodically, you're gonna need to go and double check the fluid reservoir and top it off. Make sure 100% that you never let this run dry. If you let this run out of fluid, you're gonna have to do that proper bleed procedure and it can be kind of a headache, especially when you have a car with ABS. Even though it doesn't really matter which wheel we start, I usually start at the one farthest away from the brake reservoir this is your longest brake line, so this is the one that's probably gonna take the longest to flush out. And we'll just flush this out until this fluid coming through this tube right here is clean instead of yellow. The main reason we wanna flush our brake fluid is the brake fluid is hygroscopic, which means that it absorbs and holds moisture. And that is a good thing. This helps prevent rust from damaging our calipers and our brake lines and all of our brake components. If too much moisture builds up, it can lower the boiling point of your brake fluid and can lead to a mushy brake pedal feel. It's also important to note that if your brake fluid is low, you really don't wanna just top it off. There's really only two reasons why brake fluid is low. One, you have a fluid leak and that can be a serious problem, but the fluid level also drops when your pads wear down. Now we are gonna do the exact same thing for bleeding the clutch. If we look through this right wheel well here, we can see the slave cylinder right at the transmission. Flushing this clutch fluid is just like flushing the brake fluid. We're gonna extract as much as we can out of the fluid reservoir, fill it back up, and then flush until we're getting clean fluid coming out of the bleeder. And of course, be sure you got the right fluid for this car. It actually uses brake fluid for the clutch. Now before we work on our coolant, we gotta make sure that the system is not hot. When our cooling system is hot, it is under pressure. If we release that pressure, it is gonna release that hot coolant pressure right into your face. You don't wanna do that choice. So make sure the car's cooled down as best you can. Also, really smart idea to remove the radiator cap to help the cooling system drain faster. Because our coolant looked pretty good, we're just gonna go ahead and do a drain and proper fill. If we had coolant that looked pretty sad, or was heavily contaminated, we would wanna flush that out. Typically flushing it with water repeatedly until our water comes out clean will get the job done. However, there's some times where we will need a little chemical assistance. This is when a product like CLR works really, really well. Now, if you had say an oil cooler failure, then we're looking at something a little different. What I found that works really well is just ordinary dish soap. It works really good to get that oil yuck out of your cooling system. Just be sure whatever you do, if you're adding a chemical, you flush that cooling system out and make sure you don't leave any of that chemical treatment behind. Once that's done, go ahead and drain that water out and fill it up with good, fresh, clean coolant. When it comes to refilling our cooling system, I love to use a funnel like this. This will allow us to fill our system and any air bubbles to bubble out without making a huge mess. I generally put this funnel on as soon as I close my cooling system back up. That way the system has as much time as possible in order to bleed the air out. You may still need to start the car, let it run for a little bit to get the final little bit of air out, but putting the funnel in right away and starting to fill the coolant up as soon as you can will cut down that bleed time tremendously. I also went ahead and took the coolant overflow tank off the car and cleaned it out a little bit. A lot of times getting these really clean is almost impossible, so I just scrubbed it out with soap and water as best I could. I will tell you though, installing a new coolant reservoir or overflow tank completely changes the look of the engine compartment, and when they're not that expensive, I like to put a new bottle on. I also went ahead and replaced the fuel filter on this car, sometimes telling how old or how many miles a fuel filter has on it is really, really challenging. Sometimes fuel filters will have marks when it was initially installed at the factory on it. That's a good indicator that it might be the original one. This fuel filter is pretty inexpensive, so we're gonna go ahead and get a new one on. Also, you're probably gonna lose a pretty good amount of fuel. So make sure you're working in a well-ventilated space. A couple of other extra things that I did, I went ahead and took the throttle body off and gave it a quick cleaning. Simply some throttle body cleaner and an old toothbrush 
work really well for getting the throttle body cleaned up. This one wasn't super dirty, but there's no reason to really wait until it's super dirty and causes a problem in order to clean it. Also looks like someone's had this off at some point because of that copper gasket spray. Once you have all that maintenance wrapped up, go ahead and do another visual inspection. Make sure you put all the caps on for all the stuff that we took off, oil, brake fluid, clutch fluid. We'll make sure we reinstall that air filter properly. After doing all this maintenance, I like to let the car idle for a little while, then come back and look to make sure that I don't have any leaks. Then it's time to do my favorite part, take her on a test drive and see how she performs. One of the bummers about this type of maintenance when it comes to fluid is you really don't notice a difference in the way the car drives unless you have a problem. What I'll then do is I'll park the car, let it sit overnight, and I'll come back the next day and recheck all the fluids, especially the coolant. I wanna make sure that I have all the air bubbles out of the cooling system. And there we go, we did all the maintenance on the Miata, so she is good to go. Of course, when you're doing this kind of maintenance, be sure that you properly handle these old fluids. The cool thing about the oils is we can take that to the local Advanced Auto Parts and they'll recycle it for you. All right, guys, I'm gonna wrap it up there. Questions or comments, drop them down below. And one day, we are going to get this car on the autocross course. With that, I'm out. Have an awesome day, and I'll talk to you again next time.